FM Radio for the Agile Community. www.agile.fm Hello, everyone, to uh, the Agile FM podcast, and uh, this is the pre-holiday podcast. Uh, we are close December 2013, and it's joy in the air. Um, that's the holiday season, and we want to spread some joy here today in this podcast because I have Richard Sheridan, uh, author of the soon-to-be-published book, Joy, Inc. Welcome to the podcast. Great to be here with you today. Richard, was this planned that you would go uh, and publish your book uh, in the holiday season? Well, you know, I work with uh, Penguin Random House on this, and this is the date they picked, and I couldn't help but think that releasing a book called Joy, Inc. right around Christmas sure seemed like the right time of year to do that. <laughs> it's definitely good timing. The book will come out 26th of uh, December, just right after the, the holidays. It will be on the bookshelves. I had the opportunity to actually take a look at your preview and uh, read through the book. Um, there are a couple of things I do want to talk about uh, this book. And then, obviously, and this is a, a big segue then into a public appearance you will make in New York City, you will speak about the book and about Joy on the 14th of January 2014. That's next year. That's a Tuesday at 5.30 at night. And uh, people can uh, get a copy of the book and obviously hear you talk about Joy. But before we do that, let's talk about the book a little bit, some ideas. And we see in the background uh, in the video edition um, of this podcast, we see actually Menlo Innovation. Um, and uh, one thing which actually strikes me in your book is the difference between joy and happiness. Yes. There, there is a happiness factor out there. And there's a chief happiness officer in Denmark. And he made you guys, Menlo Innovations, the happiest place uh, to work, number one. <laughs> You know, he uh, Alex Kurjolf was uh, is a good friend, no question. I've gotten to know him over the years, and fascinatingly, he was just here a couple of days ago. His first time he's actually visited Menlo, and he spent the whole day here. It was awesome to see him. So he's in Denmark. Uh, Denmark itself is the happiest country in the world. That's I researched that on the CNN list. Uh, the United States is seventeen. <laughs> Yeah. Denmark Denmark is giving uh, Menlo Innovation number one. Let me just ask you, is Menlo Innovations operating in the wrong country? <laughs> well, maybe according to Alex we are, uh, but we love our country. We love our town here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, so uh, I, I think we're, we're here to stay. All right, let's talk a little bit about Joy. There is uh, obviously Joy Inc. Uh, is, the, is the title of your book. Uh, at Menlo Innovations, there are, um, you counted them, 2,193 visitors came through your offices uh, last year in 2013. 2012. 2012, 2012 yeah. so maybe this year even more. Yeah, this um, year we're at about 2,500 so far. Yeah. What do they see when they walk through your offices? Yeah, I think when the visitors walk through our front doors, I often listen because I'm often there to greet them. And the first word I hear out of their mouths is, wow. They can actually feel the human energy in the room. And I think that's important. I think that's an important part of our culture is the human energy that's palpable in the room. What they see is a big open room. And I know that this open office concept that we've employed for the dozen years we've been in business can be controversial for some. Uh, they think it doesn't work or they think it wouldn't work for them. And that may well be true. I, I certainly don't want to expect that what we do here works for everyone. So uh, there's there's no element of what we do at Menlo where we say, oh, everyone should work exactly like us. But for us, the space is very important. This big open room, the pull-downs from the ceiling, the lightweight aluminum tables, the fact that the tables are pushed together and people are working in close collaboration helps feed the energy of the team. Mm -hmm. EMA's in charge of the space. There are no space police. There's no facilities people. They move the tables around the way that they want them. And so they, they actually form the space how they think will work best for them. Mm -hmm. So the, the visitors observe uh, joy because people are like 
happy and uh, happy at work, coming to work. I noticed your book, there are the Menlonians, I think you call them. They the Menlonians, the, yes. They come in even on the weekends to uh, move things around. I would assume there are no strict 40 hours, 9 to 5 kind of work hours at uh, Menlo. You know, we, uh, we do work a 40-hour work week. That's one of the unusual aspects of our culture is that uh, people here work 40-hour work weeks. If they come in on weekends to move the tables around, that's about all they're doing. They don't work on work it on the weekends. They don't take work home with them. If you're going to work on work at Menlo, it has to be in this room. And so we, we have this crazy counterculture, if you will, for how our industry has developed over the years. We work in the room together. We work side by side, shoulder to shoulder. Uh, we work relatively normal days, kind of mm -hmm. coming in at 8, leaving by 6. Um, generally speaking, this place is dark and locked by 6 o'clock at night. People aren't taking work home with them, so they get to enjoy time with their families. They don't work on weekends. Uh, we've never had to deny a vacation request in our 12 years of existence. And so what happens there is that we get what I like to call a humanly sustainable pace to our work. And it's very important because often the work we're doing, we're a software design and development firm. That's what we do for a living. We build software for other people. Mm -hmm. Very often the work that we're doing is holding the lives of people in its hands. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's important we do it well, and it's important we do it right, and it's important we do it in a way that lasts. Mm -hmm. You have a background in, what do we call it, old school, traditional management You, yes. es you escaped a few years ago, you created your own company. Um, there was a company, I think, in between your uh, SVP or VP position uh, in uh, in the Michigan area. Now you started your your own company a few years ago, Manlo Innovations, and uh, you started with this approach. Um, I have a super simple question here for you. It's like, how easy or difficult was it for you when you started this and you had this idea or this is how we need to work not to fall back into this old pattern sure yeah well i'm i'm personally still a work in progress every day uh, <laughs> my wife my wife will easily attest to that as well probably my children and many of my team members um but uh, for me this journey began before menlo started Uh, there was a part of my career where I wanted out. I, I didn't want to be in this business anymore because the frustrations I was feeling, uh, the lack of results that I was seeing, and I'm pretty sure early on I blamed it on myself. I thought it was me, and then I realized as I did some research and read books and studied other organizations that um, this, was a, this was a widespread issue, uh, particularly in the software industry. And so I realized that this was not a Rich Sheridan problem per se. I was just a, a kind of a member of the community that was propagating this problem in my managerial styles. And so by about 1999, uh, when Kent Beck was just starting to talk about extreme programming, I transformed my team. This was when I was a vice president at a public company, a tired 30-year-old public company, and I pulled everybody out of their offices and cubes and put them out in a big open room and we started working like we do now at Menlo. Uh, but back then, you can imagine, that was kind of a shocking transformation for a 30-year-old team. Mm. And uh, the first reaction I got from uh, one of my team members when I suggested this to them in a group meeting was, blood, mayhem, murder, Rich. Don't do it. Uh, <laughs> Don't, don't pull me out of my office. Don't put me out in a big open room. Don't make me share a computer. And for goodness sakes, please don't make me share my work with another human being. It's my code. And uh, so I knew I was, you know, this, this was a personally important mission for me. I was trying to rescue my own career. I thought I had a better way of doing things and was customary. I didn't care that it was going to be difficult to make the transition. I cared about the people. I wanted to bring them along. But I was relentless in my pursuit. And it took about six months to change the paths in the carpet uh, where mm -hmm. people suddenly started coming to me saying, you know, Rich, I don't need my cube anymore. I don't need my office anymore. I never go there anymore. I always work out in the big open room, what we back then called the Java factory at Interface Systems. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I got two years to run that experiment. And it was awesome. Mm -hmm. it, it was hard. It was a difficult transformation. 
but it was so worth it because it achieved even beyond what I was hoping for. And then one day in early 2001, it was all taken away from me when the internet bubble burst. Mm. But what couldn't be taken away from me was what I learned in the process, what I learned about myself, what I learned about organizing people. And that's when we built Menlo. So Menlo had the good fortune, if you will, even though we were starting in a very difficult time period of our mm -hmm. history, back in the, the debris of the dot-com bubble burst. Right. But we had the great fortune of starting the company with all of these cultural uh, imperatives, with all these practices in place. So Menlo has always been like this. So in some ways, you know, it was easier because we were starting from scratch with these principles already in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, the, the Java factory, there was a, uh, an experiment within an existing company, starting, starting your own company. Obviously, uh, whoever started a company before would know it takes a lot of energy out and sticking to, the, to those rules you had um, yep. developed in the Java factory. Looking back at all these years, was it worth it? Oh, it absolutely was. You know, I, I will tell you that, you know, I laid hands first time ever on a computer when I was 13 years old in 1971. And so just totaling up the years, we're at 42 years for me personally, having done something with computers. I got my first job when I was 15 as a programmer before I could even drive. So I've been in this industry for more than 42 years or more than 40 years. Mm -hmm. 14 now in this way the other 28 in the traditional way, I'm never going back. Never somebody take, if somebody had to take this away from me, uh, I'm going to go start a canoe camp in the Boundary Waters of Minnesota. <laughs> um, I, I, this, this works, and it works incredibly well. It's worked profitably for a dozen years. Um, there are so many things that are better, and, and we're not perfect. Yeah. Uh, we, I often say we have all the same problems I ever had. We just catch them when they're smaller and can correct them sooner before they get out of control. Mm. If, um, if there isn't a CEO or an executive listening to this podcast right now um, in the old school world, and what kind of advice would you have for these people um, just based on your experience? Obviously, you have a unique background having experienced both spreading yeah. joy uh, but also being in the corporate corporate America, what kind of advice would you have for these people? Yeah, if I if I look back, you know, if, if you know, I, I, I can easily uh, I've met a lot of people you're referring to who are are not at the top, can't sort of declare. But even a CEO can't really declare, right? A CEO still has to gain followership. So I will suggest to you that wherever you are in your organization. Um, you have to begin casting a vision for where you want to go. Uh, I happened to be a vice president the first time I did this, which meant I was on the executive team of this public company. The first vision casting I did wasn't with my team. It was with my peers, with my boss, with board members of this public company, and quite frankly, with a couple of shareholders. Mm -hmm. And I, I talked to them about what my vision was, what my what my enthusiasm was, and they caught it. They, they saw where I was going. They saw why I was going there. They knew it was important. So by the time I started casting this vision to my team, I had kind of pre-sold my peers on this. And then we started a series of small experiments. It is very seldom, Joe, that you can flip a corporate culture switch and have it work. Mm -hmm. uh, most organizations that do that switch flip uh, the person who did it lasts about six months, and then they get fired, and then everybody goes back to form. Uh, I had a much longer-term view of this, and so I socialized it early on with some small experiments, and I didn't flip the big switch until my team and my peers had had enough of it and experience with it to realize, yeah, Rich might be right. It, it, it still wasn't easy. I, I don't want to make it any of this sound easy, uh, but it was important. It was important to me personally. It was important mm -hmm. to the company. Um, and it was fundamental to how we were going to advance the company in those days. Mm. I mean, there's definitely one advantage for all these people out there right now is uh, they could come to uh, Menlo Innovations and actually visit. <laughs> that's, the, that's true. I didn't have that. You didn't have that. 
and uh, they could basically observe and see is that the the mood is that the um, um, is it the way how they want to uh, you know spread the joy um, by using similar work patterns as you have in place. Are you aware that any of those visitors, not only 2012, maybe even b before that, has actually started something similar with success? Um, did somebody copy you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It happens. Uh, it, it may happen more often than I realize because sometimes I get phone calls back from people who visited us two or three years ago, and they start telling me the stories of their personal transformations. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Uh, and then some of them I actually get to go see. And uh, and I see the transformation, and of course everybody's a little bit different. Mm. They have different businesses, they have different team sizes, they have different uh, constraints. Mm. Do it in their own way, but boy, they this uh, you know the touches that people have had with us have been transformational for many of our visitors. Mm. You uh, you wrote the book. It's called Joy Inc. And uh, I have uh, looked up Menlo Innovations, and uh, Menlo Innovations is an LLC. Yes. Is Inc., is this a little bit of an attack towards the corporate, corporate America? <laughs> no, this is just simply, uh, you know, the, the idea was to make it straightforward and simple for, uh, for the reader to glance at a book and say, Joy in a business context, which is a very weird idea, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in the software industry. Um, and so we wanted to capture it in as simple a way as possible that this is about the business value of joy. Mm -hmm. This isn't about happiness at work every day and everybody laughing and, and being happy-go-lucky and whistling their way to work every day because you know mm -hmm. industry, what we do as an industry is really hard. Mm -hmm. There's tough days. There's things with, that we still get frustrated with. So this is a deeper meaning, a deeper purpose, and it and is literally about what we call the business value of joy. Mm -hmm. And how is it that, you know, because a lot of people think that it's a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. If we're going to be financially successful, our work culture has to suck. You know, we have to hate work. The more we hate work, the more profit we generate. Mm -hmm. And I think that couldn't be further from the truth. This is not a zero-sum game. These two things feed one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned earlier in, in this uh, podcast, uh, Ken Beck and his writing, obviously you were influenced by extreme programming and techniques, which we now, you know, um, put under the umbrella of agile engineering. Yes. Um, you you don't make a statement like it's agile ink, it's it's joy ink. So there's there's certain aspects of uh, of your environment which uh, incorporate extreme programming and certain aspects of it. Um, but there's also something uh, like for example the stand up meeting you have, but the stand up meeting is a little bit larger in size. You do it on a company level. Sometimes yes. uh, um, what I noticed was like I could say hey Rich and we have a meeting so to speak, uh, but you could also say hey Menlo and you have a town hall. Yes. But the town hall is uh, is very different at Menlo than in, in, in any other uh, organization, I would assume. Uh, the company comes quickly together. If joy, uh, and you mentioned that in your book, is uh, having a positive impact on the business, uh, if we follow the rules of the economy, your company will grow, grow, grow. Um, and let's say Menlo Innovations is going to grow. How would Hey Menlo work in the future? What if there are thousands of people and you say, Hey Menlo? We just we need a, a speaker system, I suppose. Uh, we we've often jokingly said we could take over Michigan Stadium uh, with that seats 114,000 people and everybody work there during the week because the stadium largely sits empty during the week. So we could actually rent the facility from <laughs> the University of Michigan and. Uh, it might be a little bit of a challenge this time of year, so we might have to build a roof over it. Um, but, uh, you know, for us, uh, yes, we recognize that if things uh, grow, um, uh, there would have to be changes, just as if someone who comes here to take some of our ideas away is working inside of a one or 2,000 person organization. Mm -hmm. There would have to be adjustments. There's no question about that. Um, interestingly enough, we've tripled our footprint three times in our history. Uh, so each time we've moved, we've increased the size of our space uh, by 3x. Mm. Uh, just moved into a 18,000 square foot space, 
And it was really fun. I brought one of our team members over while we were doing the build out. And she said, hold on, Rich, hold on. And she, she said, you go to that wall and I'm going to go to the, all the way to the other end of the room. And she did. And then she calls out, hey, Menlo. And she wanted to make sure I could hear it at the other end of the room. And uh, she says, okay, the space still works. <laughs> oh, my God, it's funny. That's really good. Um, Richard, I do want to talk about one thing I also came across in, in your writing. Um, and that was with all the openness, uh, transparency, and how people work. This is a really inspiring book. There are some strict boundaries, actually, in uh, your company. For example, in the hiring uh, procedure, the way how you work, how you communicate, you make certain references to you would probably not be a good fit for Menlo. So you're really making uh, like earbuds, for example, and things like that. So there's some really strict boundaries. How did you? How did they emerge? Were they clear for you in already in the Java factory? How did how did you define those? And it seems to be like you're very strict around boundaries. You're either Mandalorian or not. Yeah, you know, um, if you think about culture, culture is made up of people. You, you, I mean, it's it's not just people, but it's practices, it's traditions, it's rituals, it's ceremonies. Those are all elements of your culture. But the part that's going to reinforce all those cultural norms is the people. Uh, I think a lot of organizations choose their people first for what they know rather than who they are as a person. Mm -hmm. We turn it around the opposite way. We, we test for a cultural fit first. And if you don't fit our culture, we're very explicit about it. We don't try and hide it from anyone. And we're not mean or undignified about it. But we are very clear. The the base, el base element of our culture is, are you a good kindergartner? Do you play well with others? Do you share? Do you support your fellow team members? Are you a team player? This is not a world for individual heroes. If you want to be a hero, if you want to be the guy or the woman who's recognized for the contribution, there are, you know, you can work pretty much anywhere else, but you can't work at Menlo. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're we're very clear about that, and we have ways to test for that, and mm -hmm. we and um, and it's different. I mean, we we're very careful about that because, as I say, you know, most cultures are very strong. You know, if you have an intentional culture and everybody knows what it is, it can be very strong. But if you start letting poison into the pond, you can kill an ecosystem very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so we're we're guarded, we, you know, and I think the whole team guards it. It doesn't have to be like. You know, Rich is at the door guarding the culture. The whole team cares about the culture. Mm -hmm. So it's protecting because your company has a, a specific size, obviously, and therefore culture. It's protecting with those boundaries, protecting what's inside. And one of the differentiations I use, and maybe this will be helpful to your audience, a lot of organizations operate in chaos. You know, mm -hmm. whether it's hiring or the way the work is done or how problems are handled or how priorities are set. It'll feel very chaotic to the people working there. Uh, chaos often looks like long days, tiring days, days where you come home and your loved one asks you how your day was and they can see how tired you look. And then they ask you a key question. Oh, did you get a lot done today? And suddenly you panic and you're like, well, actually, I got nothing done today. Mm -hmm. Got a lot of stuff started, handled a lot of emails, got a lot of interruptions, got a lot of phone calls, went to a lot of meetings, got absolutely nothing done. Chaos is the land of getting nothing done. Often the corporate antidote to chaos is bureaucracy. We swing a big needle, big lever across, and now all of a sudden we're having committees and stage gates and, and sign-offs and templated documents and processes and procedures. And you went from a land of getting nothing done to a land of getting nothing started. Mm -hmm. What humans really crave, I believe, and I think this is true of all human communities, they crave predictable, repeatable, measurable, and simple structure. If we can get down to a simple structure that's well understood by everyone, productivity will rise dramatically with that simple structure because we don't have to spend all of our time in the process, in the bureaucracy, in the meetings, or being distracted by interruptions because they're just coming at us fast and furious. 
And I think, you know, if you, if you look at the things here that look rigid, they're rigid because they are the scaffolding that holds our whole process together. Mm -hmm. So that's a different approach than most companies take to their culture, not all, obviously. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a uh, wonderful, uh, Rich, and uh, I'm, I'm want to say thank you for uh, actually taking some time out of your day, uh, talking about uh, these very important topics. Obviously, very interesting topics because we can see uh, the amount of visitors coming through your office uh, in uh, Michigan uh, every year. But also now, actually putting this thing on a bookshelf and actually uh, giving others who do not have the opportunity to come to Michigan to learn more about um, your environment and the way how you build things and uh, obviously on Agile FM uh, we have an Agile audience and uh, they can do all that mapping you just talked about joy but I think everyone in the Agile audience here on the podcast can make that mapping to Agile software engineering that's just absolutely fantastic if you uh, are interested in uh, listening more and hearing more about uh, Richard's thoughts around joy it's um, the 14th of uh, January 2014 in New York City, um, Tuesday, 5.30. Are there any other book splash events you want to uh, highlight, uh, maybe somewhere outside of New York? Yeah, I'm going to be um, on the campus of MIT just after your event, Joe. I'll be there for three different events, uh, but there will be a similar kind of event on MIT's campus. So if you have listeners or friends in the Cambridge or Boston area, uh, they'll be able to hear... Uh, uh, Polly LaBear from The Mix, the Management Information Exchange, interviewing me mm -hmm. uh, live uh, in front of an audience. And uh, that's going to be a wonderful event as well. Mm -hmm. Well, on Agile FM, we have quite a worldwide audience uh, at this point. So maybe those books should be shipped not only into uh, the East Corridor, but around the world. I uh, want to close um, with one statement I found in your book, which I think summarizes choice so, so well. Langley wanted to build a plane the Wright brothers wanted to fly. Yes, we have to always think about why we're doing what we're doing. And, um, uh, you know, otherwise we give up too soon. And the Wright brothers were never going to give up because they wanted to be in that airplane. Thank you, Rich. Take care. Thank you for listening to Agile FM, the radio for the Agile community. I'm your host, Joe Krebs. If you're interested in more programming and additional podcasts, please go to www.agile.fm. Talk to you soon.